Hey guys, my name is Tomato Anus, and this is a glitchless speedrun of Fallout 4. Right off the bat, you may be noticing that this video is a bit shorter than you expected. That's because the glitchless speedrun is around an hour 30 to an hour 40 minutes long, and I don't think that that long of a video well suits the kind of format that I go for when I do heavy commentary. So, for this video, instead of sitting through the entire run and talking your ear off for an hour and a half about what's going on, I condensed the run into a much shorter video than it originally was, and I'll do heavy commentary over this explaining all the main strats and whatnot. Now this video is still a bit lengthy, but if you would like to watch the full, unedited runs, I've uploaded two versions of it to YouTube and they're unlisted, but there are links to the two videos in the description of this video. One of them is the run as it appeared on my stream as I was doing the run live and interacting with Twitch chat, and the second one is the run with just the game audio because whenever I do speedruns nowadays, I record the audio of the game separately while I'm doing my run, so that way when I go back and do commentary later, there are not two versions of me talking. So again, if you'd prefer to watch either of those versions of the run, there are links in the description below. Fallout 4 Glitchless. What does that mean? Well, it's the same as an any percent speedrun, beat the game as quickly as possible, all that jazz, but we put a few restrictions on ourselves. These restrictions are pretty much banning anything that is clear-cut a glitch, so things like cover sliding, punch warping, load warping, item clipping, vendor glitch, all that stuff. Frankly though, a better name for this category would be no major glitches because we do a couple of things in the run that some people might consider a glitch. Glitchless categories are really a slippery slope in the speedrunning community, because really what is a glitch? Everyone has a different definition, and certain things you aren't sure if it's really a glitch. An example of this is Fallout 3 in New Vegas. If you're falling from a really high height, and right before you hit the ground you quick save and quick load, you won't take any fall damage because quick saving and quick loading resets your momentum to zero. But is this a glitch? Some would argue yes, because you're using a mechanic of the game in a way that isn't intended. But at the same time, all you're doing is quick saving and quick loading. You're not like walking into a wall or anything fancy, so it's really hard to tell if it's a glitch or not. It's cases like these where defining the rules for glitchless speedruns lead to a lot of contention among runners. The fact of the matter is you have to draw the line in the sand somewhere, and these are the rules that we decided on for Fallout 4. You can't do any of the major glitches I mentioned earlier, but you can do things like shooting people to skip their dialogues, and also cancel your landing animation in Power Armor by switching to third person and back. If you have any more nuanced questions about this whole topic with defining rules for glitchless categories, and specifically with Fallout 4 glitchless, Feel free to message me on Discord since that's the best way to contact me and I'll happily discuss it with you. Now that we have the parameters for the category more or less established, let's get into the run. Similar to any percent, Fallout 4 Glitchless is ran on patch 1.1.30. I'll explain later why we do this. We run the game on the very easy difficulty because we want to kill people faster and also take less damage. We play the game in French because it's the fastest language to play the game in, being around 11 seconds faster than English. And we limit our frame rate to 60 frames per second because the physics in Fallout 4 are tied to your frame rate, and if you play it above 60 FPS, your game will naturally go faster and you'll move faster, which is unfair to people who aren't in the position to buy a PC that runs the game at above 60 frames per second, so we limit it to 60 just so everyone's on an even playing ground. The last measure that we as speedrunners take to make sure that the competition is completely fair is that the timer we use, which is a program called Live Split, is constantly reading the memory status of the game to look for markers that indicate that the game is loading. Whenever Live Split detects one, it automatically pauses the timer on its own so that our load times aren't counted into our total time. This again is done so that people who aren't in the position to buy really fast computers aren't at a disadvantage when running the game. The run starts just like any other standard Fallout 4 speedrun. We start pre-war playing as Nate since his dialogue is faster in French than Nora's is. If you're doing a speedrun in English, it's actually faster to play as Nora because her dialogue is faster in English. Once the vault tech rep stops giving a spiel, we max out endurance and agility and then put the rest of our points into intelligence. The reason for this is that the more endurance you have, the slower your action points will drain while you're sprinting. Obviously, we want to sprint as much as possible, so this is pretty good for us. Similarly, we max out agility because that increases our total AP, which also increases the amount of time we can sprint for. 
Lastly, we dump our remaining points into intelligence since the higher your intelligence, the more XP you get, and we want to level up as much as possible throughout this run for more special points and perks. After filling out our special stats, we really just kind of coast until we get into the vault, and then we get frozen, and then after that is when the run really begins. Also, you may have noticed by now, but there's a heart with a number next to it at the bottom of the screen. That's actually my heart rate. I started wearing a monitor during streams just so the viewer can see when I'm getting nervous and get a sense for when the run's getting particularly intense for the runner. After we thaw out and get our bones moving, we pick up a security baton which is a weapon we're going to be using for about a minute and then we're never going to touch it again. We have to kill all of the rad roaches inside of Vault 111 because in order to pick up the pit boy at the end, you can't be in combat. Killing all of them is a lot faster and safer of a strat than just killing a few and then trying to make yourself lose aggro and make it so you're not in combat at all, which is really finicky and doesn't always work. After we kill all the rad roaches, we promptly pick up the pit boy and open the vault door, and then we want to stand right in this corner while it's opening because that actually triggers the elevator to come down before we actually enter the room, which some may argue to be a glitch, but you're really just standing in a corner while you wait. Once the door is open, we do this fancy jump that's super easy and you never fail, ever, and then we get to exit the vault. Once we're in the wasteland, we want to make a mad dash to the Museum of Freedom, along the way picking up some frag grenades that always spawn inside of this mailbox. Once you get to the Museum of Freedom, you want to be sure to show off how you didn't really play shooters on PC growing up, and you mostly played shooters on console, as well as playing a lot of sports and racing games. just like that. Once we clear out the interior of the Museum of Freedom, we briefly talk with Preston Garvey and Sturges, and then we promptly head out to the roof to enter the power armor. Once in the power armor, we want to take out this guy on the roof across the road real quick with our pistol, because if we don't kill him, then it's up to Preston to kill him, and Preston isn't the best shot, so it's a lot safer for us to just take the time ourselves to kill him. After that, we grab the minigun and then we head down the road to kill the Deathclaw real quick, followed by cleaning up the remaining raiders in the streets. We fast travel back to the Museum of Freedom and ditch our power armor there, conveniently at the fast travel location, for reasons you'll see later. And then we talk with Preston and Mama Murphy to progress the main quest. Once we're out of the Museum of Freedom, we bind and equip the items that we've picked up so far, and we also level up both Action Boy and Solar Powered. Action Boy makes it so that your AP regenerates 25% faster, which is effectively giving yourself a huge boost to endurance. Solar Powered makes it so that your strength and endurance are increased by 2 whenever the in-game hours are between 6am and 6pm. This is super useful throughout the speedrun because we do a lot of long running segments during daytime. We then do our first long running segment of the run, making our way from the Museum of Freedom to downtown Boston, being sure to discover the campus law offices and green tech genetics along the way. Now, before I get ahead of myself, you may be wondering why exactly we just did the Museum of Freedom, and there are a few reasons for that. One of the more straightforward reasons why we do it so early is because it gives us a couple levels which we then use to level up Action Boy and Solar Powered as you just saw. Another relatively straightforward reason why we do the Museum of Freedom towards the beginning of the run is that we just simply run by the location early on and it makes sense to do it now rather than backtrack later. The last main reason why we actually save the Minutemen is because we are going to be building the teleporter with them to enter the Institute. If you're unfamiliar with the main quest, you have to build a teleporter to enter the Institute at around the halfway point in the game, and you have to build the teleporter with one of three available factions at that point in the game, which are the Minutemen, the Brotherhood of Steel, and the Railroad. 
In order to actually build a teleporter with one of these factions, you have to be a member of the faction and also have their trust by doing a loyalty mission or two. The Minutemen are hands down the fastest in terms of getting to know them and also completing a loyalty mission. That doesn't necessarily mean though that they're the faction that we're going to complete the game with. We'll talk more about that topic later though. Our main goal right now is to get to Good Neighbor and do a little bit of shopping, but we make a quick pit stop at the Charles View Amphitheater to steal a fat man in the green shirt and combat boots. The green shirt and combat boots are super helpful for this run because they increase our endurance by one whenever we have them equipped. Once we get to Good Neighbor, we pickpocket Fahrenheit in order to steal all of her 5mm ammo. This pickpocket right here is the exact reason why we play on patch 1.1.30. Later on in the patch history of this game, they made it so you have a 0% chance to steal this ammo from her. But when we play on patch 1.1.30, we have a 90% chance to do so. Some people consider this to be a glitch because you're pickpocketing her with steal chances that seemingly aren't what they're intended to be. But because you're performing an entirely normal action on an officially released patch of the game, it's allowed in glitchless runs. After we steal the ammo, we then talk with Daisy, who we trade all of our 5mm ammo to in exchange for store credit. With that store credit, we purchase Destroyer's left leg piece, and also look for a biometric scanner, which unfortunately she didn't have in her inventory in this run. The Destroyer's left leg is an incredible piece of armor for the run because it increases our move speed by 10% whenever we have it equipped. After purchasing the leg piece from Daisy, we proceed to steal a Fat Man and Mini Nuke from Cleo, after which we promptly escape from Good Neighbor, doing a serpentine pattern in the process to take as little damage as possible. Once we're outside of Good Neighbor, we bind and equip everything that we just bought and stole and make our way into Park Street Station, which if you don't know, is where Vault 114 is located, which is where one of the main characters in the story named Nick Valentine is being held captive. In order to rescue Nick, we pretty much just sprint past all of the trigger men and make a beeline for the Vault 114 entrance. Once we're in Vault 114, we toss one of those grenades we picked up a while ago in order to kill Dino, who's talking with Nick, who's being held inside of the Overseer's office. After killing Dino, we pick up the password for the Overseer's terminal, rescue Nick, have a few brief words with him, and then we make our mad dash to escape from the vault. This escape more or less just consists of killing all of the trigger men in our way, and then after clearing out each section, we sit down and wait an hour so that Nick can catch up and we don't have to wait for him to run all the way through the vault. One little fun fact and time save in this section is that normally when you play through, you have to sit there and wait for Nick to open up a couple locked doors. Instead, once Nick begins his animation to open the doors, if you talk to Nick, it'll immediately open the doors and complete Nick's actions. Once we're back in Park Street Station, we're confronted by Skinny Malone, but luckily we still have one more grenade that we picked up earlier, so we just toss that to clear out his whole group. After we kill Skinny Malone, we shoot Nick a couple times to skip some lines of dialogue, and we sprint past a bunch of trigger men in order to exit Park Street Station and return to the Commonwealth. After a brief dialogue with Nick to get on the same page, he decided to meet up with him in his detective agency inside of Diamond City. Luckily, it's only a few city blocks away, so we get there pretty quickly by just sprinting. Before we actually enter Diamond City proper, we first pickpocket Kellogg's house key off of Mayor McDonough, who's outside having his whole hate newspaper dialogue with Piper. After that, we enter Nick's detective agency inside of Diamond City, and inside there, we actually will shoot Ellie once, because that'll skip a whole intro dialogue with her, which again, is allowed by the rules. After having a brief dialogue with Valentine and Ellie about your missing son, we then head over to Kellogg's house with Nick to look for some clues. There we're able to get some pretty sick loot, including two quantums, as well as some ammo and a couple stim packs. The game then forces dog meat down your throat, even if you haven't met him yet, and you're supposed to follow him to Fort Hagen. We know where we're supposed to be heading though, so we don't necessarily need to follow dog meat, but we do need to talk to him in order to advance the quest. After talking with the pup, we fast travel to College Square, which is a location that we discovered on our run from Museum of Freedom down to Good Neighbor. On our run to Fort Hagen, we have to be sure to discover Grey Garden, which is a location that we're going to be fast traveling back to later when we're doing a quest for the faction we side with. Once we actually arrive at Fort Hagen, we enter through a hatch on the roof and then we pretty much sprint all the way through until our meeting with Kellogg.
Once we make it past his synth bodyguards, we have a brief discussion with Kellogg and use a big gun skill check to convince him to hand over his cybernetic enhancements. In addition to the enhancements, we force him to hand over everything on his body, including his signature revolver and some stealth boys. Once we're done in this area, we swiftly make our exit and fast travel back to the Diamond City Market. Now, if you listen closely, you might be able to hear a strange audio bug that started happening during this run that we were kind of laughing at during the stream. For some reason, during the middle of the run, when I started interacting with Nick, it sounded like there was some sort of helicopter noise or like metal banging around always off to the side, and the best explanation we came up with was either that Nick had a vertebrate up his butt, or he was just clapping his ass cheeks together really fast. Either way, it stopped happening after we stopped interacting with Nick. Nothing really happens here other than having a brief dialogue with Piper and Nick, trying to figure out where to go next. We decide the most logical place to go is the memory den, since we have a piece of Kellogg's brain, and the memory den taps into memories. The memory den, as always, is as boring as ever. We don't really do much outside of just talking with Amari and Nick real quick, waiting for Amari to put Kellogg's brain inside of Nick's head, yada yada, walking through the memory sequence, and then waiting for the Kellogg and X688 to finish talking. The slow-paced memory den sequence is followed by another very slow-paced sequence where we proceed to run through the glowing sea in order to make it to Virgil's lab. Here we briefly talk with the former institute scientist who is now a super mutant named Virgil, who tells us we need to get a coarser chip from a coarser somewhere in the wasteland. In my opinion, this is the turning point in the glitchless category and when it becomes a really fun speedrun. After you talk with Virgil, you're supposed to do this whole Carmen San Diego hunt for a Courser, but we know that the Courser actually spawns inside of Green Tech Genetics, so we just head there. Green Tech Genetics is a really fascinating place in the game. When you play through the game normally, it's probably one of the more combat intensive parts of your entire playthrough. Naturally though, combat is slow when it can be avoided, so we actually just sprint through this whole segment but we do have to worry about the fact that there's an all-out war going on inside of Green Tech Genetics and there are explosions everywhere that we have to avoid. In order to reduce the amount of damage we take in the split, and to also mitigate the chance of dying, I pop some Psycho that I found in the container earlier on in the run, which gives us plus 25 damage resist. In addition to the Psycho, I also leveled up the perk Toughness to have permanent plus 10 damage resist, and also Moving Target to have plus 25 damage resist whenever I'm sprinting. Halfway through Green Tech Genetics, I used a frag grenade that I took from Kellogg to take out a mercenary who has a missile launcher on the floor above me. This way, when I run across the bridge where the mercenary spawns, they won't kill me, and I can also pick up the missile launcher for our own personal use later on. After we somehow survive all the mercenaries and make it to the top floor, we take the elevator up to the upper level of Green Tech Genetics, where we have a brief dialogue with the Courser in order to convince him to hand over his Courser chip. While we're all the way up here, we pick up a mini nuke that's hidden underneath this staircase, and then we exit and fast travel to Mass Fusion. So if you're unfamiliar with the main story of Fallout 4, the reason why we need the Courser chip more or less is to allow for us to teleport into the Institute because it'll allow for us to hone in on where the Institute actually is when we want to teleport because the Institute it turns out doesn't really have an entrance and all this jazz about you need to teleport and you can't really just walk on in. The only issue is that Courser chips, while they would tell us the location of where the Institute is, are encoded so we need to decode them. Luckily, the railroad is just the place to go to decode Courser chips. Now, to be honest, the last split involves us being a bit of a pansy where we just ran through and didn't really fight anyone, but this split is the complete opposite. It's totally unnecessary to actually fight in this split, but we're gonna go ahead and massacre all of the railroad members. The reason for this is you don't actually need to talk with the railroad to decode the Courser chip, all you need to do is kill all of them, access Tinker Tom's terminal, and then you'll be able to decode the Courser chip yourself. The way that we actually kill the railroad is pretty straightforward. We use one of the mini nukes that we picked up so far to clear out the stronger enemies out front, and then we use Kellogg's revolver to clean up the rest. Once we clear out all the railroad members, we decode the Courser chip ourselves, and then exit the HQ and Old North Church and head back to Virgil. 
Here we tell him that we've decoded the chip with the help of the railroad, and Virgil will then hand over some teleporter plans. Now, I've been holding out the information on who we side with at the end of the run for long enough, so now I guess it's time to tell you that we end up siding with the Institute. The reason for this is that once you enter the Institute, they're hands down the most streamlined quest line to follow that involves the fewest amount of quests to actually do. One of the quests that we have to complete by the end of the game for the Institute in order to side with them is called End of the Line. In this quest, you have to go to the Railroad HQ and kill off their leaders. By killing off all of the Railroad now, we kill two birds with one stone by pretty much completing End of the Line early and also being able to decode the chip ourselves. Once we have the teleporter plans from Virgil, it's time to actually build the teleporter. As I mentioned earlier, we do this with the Minutemen, but I also mentioned that we need to complete a loyalty quest for them. For some reason, saving them from a Deathclaw and a pack of raiders isn't quite enough, so we have to do one other quest for them. That quest is going to be one of the Radiant quests that Preston Garvey assigns to us. Lucky for us, 99% of the time this quest is the one at Ten Pines Bluff. After talking with Preston Garvey and confirming that that's the quest we get, we fast travel to the Museum of Freedom since it's a nearby location to Ten Pines Bluff, and we make our run over to the settlers. Now, because this Radiant quest is the first one that you're doing, and it serves as a loyalty quest for the Minutemen, it actually has a name and is part of the main quest line, and it's called the First Step. If you're unfamiliar with the First Step, it pretty much consists of some settlers needing you to kill some nearby raiders. Now, Bethesda actually gave the player a couple options on how to complete this quest. The most straightforward option is obviously to go and kill all of the raiders yourself, but Bethesda did put in a second way to solve the quest for us savvy players who really notice their surroundings. Now, casually, when you explore Ten Pines Bluff, you may notice that they aren't really well equipped to fight anyone off. Sure, the settlers may have a pistol or two, but really they don't have a lot of ammo. That's why Bethesda made it so that if you just give the settlers a couple rounds to go fight off the raiders themselves, the quest automatically ends. So, all we have to do for this quest is run to Ten Pines Bluff, as we're doing right now, give the sleeping settlers two bullets exactly, and then just fast travel back to Sanctuary because now the settlers at Ten Pines Bluff have enough ammo to fight off the raiders themselves. Unfortunately, once we get back to Sanctuary and we talk with Preston, our dialogue does seem to indicate that the settlement died in their fight against the raiders, but hey, you'll win some, you lose some. After we regroup with Preston, we're able to build a teleporter and enter the Institute. Upon entering the Institute, we have to talk with Father, who, if you don't know, is our kidnapped son, and we say to him that we'll end up joining the Institute and helping fight for his cause. The rest of the run now is just completing the Institute storyline. This begins by making your rounds in the Institute to meet all the division leaders. There really isn't anything of note here, we just talk with the four division leaders, but we do gain the ability to fast travel to and from the Institute from Dr. Lee. After this, we go and talk with Sean, who tells us that we need to go and reclaim a renegade synth who became a raider at the Libertalia, which is an old abandoned ship. We fast travel to Old North Church and then make our break to the Libertalia, where we meet up with X688, who is a synth courser for the Institute. After our rendezvous with the courser, we do a tightrope walk up to the top of the Libertalia and enter the captain's quarters. There, we walk away from a dialogue with X688, grab a mini-nuke, and exit to where the rogue synth is located. By simply shooting his two raider sidekicks, X688 will read off the synth's recall code, at which point we can fast travel back to the Institute and finish the quest. Back at the Institute, we'll be praised for a job well done and told that we should go visit our new quarters inside of the Institute. Typically, you go to the quarters and wait for X688 to talk to you and say that Sean wants to speak with you again, but all you actually need to do is enter the room and exit immediately and the quest will progress. Once we speak with Sean again, he'll let us know that we have to go and reclaim some synths that are being held at Bunker Hill under the protection of the railroad. After we speak with Sean, we travel back to Old North Church and run over to Bunker Hill, where we proceed to mow down an institute courser named X418. With X418 dead, we simply need to run out of range of any enemies, and then we can simply fast travel away, and we don't need to do this quest, and the main quest will progress. 
Instead of fast traveling back to the Institute, we actually fast travel to the campus law offices. The reason for this is that it's right next to the CIT ruins, which is where we actually need to speak with Sean because he's getting his first glimpse of the wasteland. When we enter the CIT ruins and are running up to the roof to speak with Sean, we take a two second detour to pick up another mini nuke that's laying on the ground inside of the building. When we get to the roof, we unequip our 10mm pistol and then we punch Sean once to skip a line of dialogue that we normally wouldn't be able to mash through. We then talk with Sean and learn that he really doesn't like the wasteland and would like to go through with his plans. From here, we re-enter the institute and then are told that we need to attend a directorate meeting. This typically would mean that we'd sit down with all the division heads and father and then sit through a prolonged dialogue. It turns out, though, that if you get up when the dialogue starts, fast travel away, do something just to kill a couple seconds and then fast travel back, enough time will have passed in-game that the dialogue will have ended naturally. This is indicated to actually be an intended feature of the game by your dialogue with father after you return saying, what did I miss? When we fast travel away to skip the dialogue in this directorate meeting, we actually fast travel to the Museum of Freedom to pick up our power armor. The reason why we didn't use the power armor all throughout the run is that your move speed is significantly decreased whenever you use it. Now that we have our power armor though and we skip the directorate meeting, we speak with Sean and learn that he's dying of cancer and that we're going to be the new head of the institute after he passes away. After this shocking revelation with your son, we speak with Ali Fillmore and we talk about the next plan of attack, which is to go to mass fusion and get a beryllium agitator which will be used to power the institute's reactor. From here, we enter the elevator in the center of the institute, ride it up to the teleporter relay, and teleport out to mass fusion. Using the relay to teleport to mass fusion automatically makes it so that you're enemies with the Brotherhood of Steel and you can no longer side with them throughout the game, but that's fine for the speedrun. Once we arrive at Mass Fusion, we grab a key card that's located in a desk and then we use our power armor to jump off of the roof of Mass Fusion without taking any damage. This is the reason why we wanted to go and grab the power armor because it allows for us to skip a prolonged elevator fight sequence that normally we would just sit through with stealth boys to not actually have to fight. Here we ditch our power armor, enter Mass Fusion, and take an elevator down to the reactor. In the reactor level, we go and grab the beryllium agitator, utilizing a hazmat suit that we found in a neighboring room right next to the beryllium agitator itself. Once we have the agitator though, the entire system goes on lockdown and a bunch of robots are dispatched in order to kill us. Luckily, we still have some mini nukes and we do still have our missile launcher that we got in Green Tech Genetics. We use one fat man and a missile in order to take out a sentry bot that spawns, followed by using one missile to kill a protectron. This will then open up the next room where two Assaultrons spawn, but we can easily take them both out with just one mini nuke. Heading upstairs, one more Protectron spawns, but we can take him out with just one missile. After killing all the robots, the lockdown will cease and we'll be able to take the elevator back up to the main floor of Mass Fusion. From there, we exit and teleport back to the Institute to talk with Sean about what our next steps are. Sean lets us know that we have to go and reclaim another synth who this time is located in Grey Garden. Lucky for us, Grey Garden is the location that we were sure to discover when we were running to Fort Hagen oh so long ago. However, right before we fast travel to Grey Garden, we dump all of our skill points that we've earned from leveling up into Charisma. The reason for this is after we fast travel to Grey Garden and take out a bunch of enemies outside with one mini nuke, we have to pass a speech check with the synth in order to convince him to come with us back to the Institute. Back in the day, we actually didn't really level up Charisma too much throughout the run, so this speech check really could be a run killer. Fortunately though, 8 Charisma is more than enough to pass an intermediate speech check with ease, so we just do that and then we head back to the Institute again. Back in the Institute, we speak with Sean who for some reason has locked himself inside of this playpen, and then we record our radio message which we'll be broadcasting to the entire commonwealth. There really isn't any speed tech involved here, all you have to do is mash through the dialogue. After our little recording session, we speak with Sean one more time and then we fast travel to the Diamond City Marketplace. From here, we do a fancy little jump and then head over to the radio station where we equip it with a bunch of little fancy gear and broadcast our signal.
Returning to the Institute, Father and all of the division heads are in the reactor level, waiting to activate the reactor with the beryllium agitator that we took from mass fusion. After we do the honors of activating the reactor, we punch Father a couple times to skip some lines of dialogue without killing him because he really doesn't have a lot of health, so shooting him will kill him, and then we speak with him real quick and head back to the main institute area and hold another meeting with the division heads. Now, throughout the run, you might have noticed that I'm playing with dialogue camera off. If you're unfamiliar with Fallout 4, by default you have this setting on called Dialogue Camera, where whenever you speak it goes into a cinematic mode, showing each character's face as they speak. This is typically slow in Fallout 4 speedruns because you're not able to move around when you're in Dialogue Camera mode, which is really suboptimal because you want to be able to freely position yourself whenever you're talking with people. However, when we get to this point in the glitchless run, we only have three dialogues left. And of these three dialogues, two of them are much faster if you have dialogue camera on. The reason for this is when you don't have dialogue camera on for these specific dialogues, the NPCs really like to lock up, and you can't skip their lines. By enabling dialogue camera though, we can ensure that we're always able to skip their lines, overall making these lengthy dialogues much faster. After skipping through this whole dialogue with the division leaders talking about what our plans are for the institute, we then wait one hour to give Father enough time to walk back from the reactor level, and then we go and talk to him real quick about what we're about to do. After speaking with Father, we have to go and talk with Dr. Lee one last time, as well as with an institute scientist named Rosalind. We talk about the overall plan for the upcoming attack, and we're given a bunch of equipment for our assault at the Boston airport on the Brotherhood of Steel. If you're unfamiliar with the story of Fallout 4, when you finish the game with the Institute, you head to the Boston Airport, which is where the Brotherhood of Steel is located. The Brotherhood of Steel is currently repriming Liberty Prime, which you may remember from Fallout 3 as a giant democracy-loving robot. Coincidentally, this giant democracy-loving robot also has giant democracy-loving lasers. The Institute's goal is to hijack Liberty Prime and use it to destroy the Brotherhood of Steel, as the Brotherhood of Steel is seen as opposition to the Institute, as they have very different ideologies. After speaking with Dr. Lee and Rosalind about our plan for attack on the Brotherhood of Steel, we are then given a bunch of equipment and take the elevator up to the relay to head out to the Boston airport. When we arrive at the Boston airport, we immediately pop a stealth boy and begin our attack. This consists of first eliminating three generators that are located at various points around the airport. These generators are used by the Brotherhood in order to prevent the Institute from relaying in since to help with their attack. After destroying all three generators, we have to make it up to the top platform where Liberty Prime is located. Once we're up there, we throw down a couple relay beacons so that synths can teleport in, as well as throwing down a bunch of synth grenades which spawn some synths that will help us with our attack. The goal in the quest right now is to defend Liberty Prime while we have a virus synth come in and reprogram to do the Institute's bidding, which is to shoot down the Pridwin. The easiest way to do this is to more or less throw all the grenades as we have, and then turtle up with something like a stealth boy and also a minigun, and shoot down any vertebrates, and also just kind of hope that you don't get unlucky with a virus getting killed by any grenades or anything like that. This split is pretty simple, but the capacity for huge failure during this split is very high. Lucky for us, it went off without a hitch, and we were able to successfully reprogram Liberty Prime in as fast a time as possible. Once we take over Liberty Prime, we have to evacuate the airport and get as far away as we can so we don't get blown up in the whole wreckage of the Pridwin and everything. When we get a safe enough distance away, a half stealth boy courser will teleport in and bring us to the shoreline to watch the Pridwin get destroyed. Once the Pridwin is destroyed, we teleport back to the Institute, run up to see Sean, and greet him with a loving couple bullets in order to kill him and end the main questline. The run is considered to be complete when our HUD disappears as the screen fades to black. I've lost Sean. All over again. This video is a much different format from what I usually do, but it was such a long run, I wanted to try something a little different. If you made it this far in the video, I'd just like to say thank you, and I really appreciate you as a person. 
I'd also really appreciate it if you left a comment for me down below and let me know how you like this video format for the longer types of runs. It'd be a huge help if you guys let me gauge your interest in these more streamlined kinds of videos for longer runs as I'm currently sitting on another world record that I want to do heavy commentary over, but it's about a two hour long run. So again, if you could please leave a comment below, let me know how you liked the video. I'd love to hear what you guys think, and if you have any feedback or critiques, go ahead and throw that down there as well. I'm always looking to improve the way I present my runs. Outside of that, this has been a glitchless speedrun of Fallout 4. I'm Tomato Anus, and I hope you have an above average day. I know the world has changed, but the road ahead will be hard. This time, I'm ready. Because I know war. War never changes.